You're listening to the Second Corinthians Weakness and Strength Sermon Series, preached by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. Verse number 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the down payment of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are mani- made manifest in your consciences. This is the word of the Lord this morning. I, I want to begin this morning by just asking four questions, and I, I don't think you need to answer out loud. I, I don't think I want you to answer out loud, but I do want you to think about these questions. Here's the first. Do you believe in life after death? Just think. And some people don't. I understand. I want you to be honest this morning. Here's a second question. Do you believe in a bodily resurrection? Here's the third. Do you believe in judgment in the future? Okay, so you got those? Here's the last one. Does your, does your life, does my life, reflect what we say we believe? A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And this is true. And I would ask you this morning to really, and I want you to think, I want you to, to listen This text is is so packed and powerful. There's so much happening in this text. But Tozer reminds us that what comes into our mind first when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Why? Because what we truly believe about God, what we truly believe, not the answers we give, like, hey, tell me about God. Well, he is omni, omnipresent, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, um, his aseity, his eternality. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about In reality, in the quietness of your heart and mind, what do you believe about God? Because that's going to impact truly how we live. And I wonder this morning, if we were honest about that, if our thoughts about God would be something like this. He's not that good. I'm not sure that he's kind. I don't think he's fair. I'm not sure he even cares or knows or can help. And we do, if we're honest this morning, we do have those thoughts about God. And what I'm saying this morning is the way we view him and what we believe about him does impact the way we live. And and listen to me, we, we all have thoughts about God that are not right. And let me remind you, God is not what you think he is. God is what he says he is, regardless of what we think. And here in this text, we have Paul again 
speaking to us about what he knows about God, what he knows about the resurrection, what he knows about this life and the life to come. Listen to what Scott Halfman says about this passage, and I, and I hope it helps us as we get ready to dive into the text. He says, experiencing God in the present. Okay? And when he says that, he's talking about the true God, the God who has revealed himself, the, the great I am. Right? Not what we think or perceive, but how he truly is. Experiencing God in the present creates in us a craving for the full revelation of his glory in the future. So, so stay with me. Experiencing true God now, in the present, where we live, when we experience him truly as he is, it will naturally um, uh, create within us this desire within our hearts and our lives for a full revelation of his glory, which in turn creates a deep desire to live now in light of the realities to come. Okay? So, so, talking about this text, he, he realizes what Paul has done. Paul says, this is what I believe, this is what I know, this is what I long for, and this is why I live the way I live. And if we come into contact with the real God in our present day life, it creates a desire to know him fully, to see him face to face, to be with him. But it doesn't stop there. In turn, it creates a deep desire to live now in light of the realities to come. And what Paul believes, longs for, and what he does all blend in the mix of life. And I would argue this morning that what we believe and long for and do, it's the mix of our life. It's who we are. And I want you to see this morning in light of what Paul knows, what he knows to be true of the risen Christ and the resurrection, he longs for, and it changes his life. So let's look at the text this morning, and Paul is going to help us with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1, for we know. And again, you remember how this works. You've got to be careful. Sometimes we take verses, and we, this is my favorite verse, and we just pull it out of Scripture. We pull it out of context. This is not written in a vacuum. Paul has been talking about the resurrection in chapter 4. He's been talking about the glory of Christ, the spirit within, seeing those things that are unseen, talking about the eternal that has weight, a tonnage of weight and glory compared to the things that are passing. And he's continuing this thought now, speaking about our bodies, eternity, the resurrection, life, and judgment. And this chapter, honestly, it is packed with Christian doctrine and teaching about the last days. It's important. So he says in, in verse number one, for we know, what I've just talked about, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle or tent, and, and so stay with me now because what he's going to start talking about is he's still thinking about eternity, but he's going to turn to you and I now talking about this tent, this tabernacle. And he uses that metaphor to describe this life, this, the flesh, he talks about the body, the flesh, the outer man. Just in chapter 4, he talked about the body being like a jar of clay, a cracked pot, if you would, right? And so he's going to remind us as he begins this that our body is like a tent. And what he wants to say to us is, like a tent, this body, this physical body that we all live in. You're here this morning. You came with your tent on. Okay, you came in your tabernacle. And what he says is, this tent is weak, vulnerable, and not permanent. How many folks this morning, you are campers, but wait, you are real campers, like you are tent campers. Can I see your hands? Okay, God bless you. Now listen, you know, if you've been here for any length of time, I don't like camping. And I don't like camping because I don't like camping. I, I don't. I was trying to think about my experiences with camping. And when we were younger, my father's family had a piece of property in West Virginia. Mountain Mama, take me home, country road, that West Virginia. Right? And, and it was a, a plot up in these mountains. That was, it was a cemetery. And their family, for, I mean, for generations, were buried there. And part of our fun summer vacation was to go camping in the cemetery um, in West Virginia. 
And you have to understand my family. I mean, I talk about hillbillies. I mean, West Virginia, Bluefield, West Virginia, coal mines, they are hillbillies. And so we'd go there and we'd work cotton mouth. Um, snakes are there, poisonous snakes. Is it cotton mouth or copperhead? It's copperheads, I think, there. Copperhead. Um, and they would, this is what, this is what, my family did anyways, the adults for entertainment, they would find switches off trees and hit the children with them, right? So, so when I come to you about camping, I'm really scarred, man, really scarred. And then when I was 17, I went off to the service. I was stationed in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And you know the old song, Cold Kentucky Rain? It is really cold in October, really cold. And we did a bivouac. We were in tents. And for that week of tents, it rained nonstop in October, Fun camping. Right? <laughs> and so I can't stand it. I just can't. If I'm going to go camping, it's going to be at the Holiday Inn. And it's going to be with a warm shower. And, and what's with this bug thing, right? I mean, oh, the black flies, they cut you and you bleed to death. What? I mean, it's, and it's bugs and insects and dirt and filth and God bless you. I mean, go for it. But you know, if you're a camper in a tent, the tent, of course, is not permanent. By God's grace, you get to go home, right, to a real home, a real house. Um, And you know it's vulnerable and weak. If you're in bear country, which is more than possible in Ontario, and you're in a tent, do you know bears are terrifying? Not only do they run, They climb and they swim. You cannot get away from them. It would be a nightmare. And when you're in your vulnerable tent and the bears come around, you look like a fast food wrapped in some paper wrapping that's just waiting to be devoured. It's vulnerable, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in a castle with a moat and ammunition then be in a tent because it is weak, it is temporary, and it's vulnerable. And Paul says, I want you to understand, and Paul was a tent maker. This this resonated with him and people there. This body, it's a tent. It is weak. It's vulnerable. And it's not permanent. So he's going to use this illustration now to help us understand the life that we live and what we do in this tent that someday we'll be packed up and we'll move home. He says in verse number one, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Let me remind you this morning about this tent, this body that we have. It is not permanent. It will be dissolved. Now let me ask you a question. When he says dissolved, what do you think he's talking about? The word literally means demolished. So in our vernacular today, when he says, hey, just let you know, your tent is going to be dissolved, what is he talking about? Dave, you're going to die. This is a nice way of saying this tent, this body will be dissolved. It will be demolished. And he begins with the perennial problem of human existence, death. The stats now are out that the human mortality rate is hovering right now at 100%. 100%. May may I make a bold prediction this morning? 100 years from now, with maybe the exception of one or two children, no one in this auditorium will be here. This house will be dissolved. And it's funny how we deal with death, even as Christians. We ignore it. We don't talk about it. We joke about it. You know, there's that um, kids say the darndest things. And one of the questions were asked, why doesn't God tell you the day that you die? And the kid said, because he wants it to be a big surprise. (laughs) Right? Mm -hmm, It's a big surprise. But let's be honest this morning about death. It's an enemy. It's an enemy. It's an ugly, nasty enemy. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about death. Now, he's talking about Christians being delivered from it. 
But in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 15, he says that Christ, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. He says, Christ came to deliver us, but I want you to know that for the average person, there is a fear of death and it keeps us in bondage because we know in our heart, no matter what we say or think, that we are all marching to the grave. So Paul says, I want to remind you of something. This tent will be dissolved. And there's fear in death. And we deceive ourselves. And I don't know everyone in this room. I, I, I would believe that the majority of our believers here, I'm sure some are not, and that's good. I'm glad you're here. But, but we deceive ourselves. When this idea of death, it's always like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know death is coming. Just not now. Not now. The Beatles had a song, um, When I Get Older, Losing My Hair, Many Years From Now. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 60? Four. Some of you folks remember that song? Yeah. And for an 18-year-old, I'm sure that 64 sounds ancient. When I was 17, my parents were young. My parents at 17 were, let me do the math, um, 37? Is that right? My mom had me when she was 16? Yeah, 30, my parents, right? Having children. So, I mean, I had young parents, but I thought my, my own mind, my parents at 40 were ancient. Oh, my goodness, 40 years old. Do you know now that I'm 47, I don't think 64 is old at all. I think 64 is, you're heading towards your prime, baby. How many 64-year-olds are here? We have a 64-year-old here this, that would admit it? Oh, John, oh, Steve, maybe I'm wrong. Steve, you're not 64. Are you 64? Liars, liars, liars. <laughs> but at 64, John, you don't think I'm just packing it in. You feel young and vibrant and alive, right? I mean, most days. And then when you're 70 or 80, right? It's, isn't it funny? E even when we get into our 90s, we're surprised at people who pass away. Kim's grandma this last year was a really difficult year for us. 95 years old. The year before that, she got her driver's license renewed. How, what are people in Ohio thinking? That's <laughs> terrifying. And she's she driving all around. And yet at 95, still surprised, she passed away. We deceive ourselves. It's always not now. It's, it's later. And for some of us in this room, in our spiritual life, we've been saying for a long time, Later, I'm going to. Oh, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to sell out. I, I know, God, there's some, I'm missing the dots here, but later. And for some of you, you've been sitting in church for a long time, and you're saying, I know I'm lost. I know I'm without Christ. I know there's a price to pay. I know I need salvation, but I will do it later. I read a quote this week from Henry Cloud. He said this, Later is one of the most abused drugs we have available to us. It kind of makes things go away. Why? Because when we say it, we think we are actually going to do it later. We deceive ourselves. And Paul says that this tent will be dissolved. It will be demolished. And unless the Lord comes back, every one of us will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And so Paul says, I want you to know about this tent. It will be dissolved. Then he says, um, continuing in verse number one, he says, For we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul lived a life of hardness. He lived a life of suffering. He, he lived a life of struggle. It didn't stop him. And here, even speaking about death, he says, okay, this, this tent will be dissolved, but I want you to know something. I'm not discouraged. I'm not recoiling from this. That's the reality. I'm not discouraged. Why? Because we have a building of God not made with hands 
eternal in the heavens, a, a body that's coming that's not a tent, that is not weak, that is not vulnerable, that is permanent. A body that God has prepared for his people that was fit for eternity. He's talking about life after life after death. And Paul says, for the believer, I don't have to be discouraged by this. I don't have to recoil from this. This truth is truth. This tabernacle will dissolve. But even in the dissolving of this, our union with Christ, our fellowship with Christ, it's not even interrupted. Death cannot interrupt our fellowship with him because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He has prepared for us a body. There is no soul sleep. There's no ghostly guy moving around and like, they're here. No, I go from life to death to real, true life. And Paul says, I'm not discouraged, not at all, because we shall see him face to face in a body. In a body. This is probably the most glorious hope for the believer today. We have loved ones that we cared for. They've passed along. We don't close a casket and shovel dirt over the casket and think goodbye forever. Because of the Christian hope that we have, because Jesus Christ died, was buried, and said, I'm not staying here, and rose victorious, there is coming a day when we will hold them, we will touch them, we will hug them, we will kiss them, We will experience them again. What a blessed hope that is. And we have that hope. And so Paul says, this tent will be dissolved. I am not discouraged. A matter of fact, I groan. I groan for this. Look now at verse number 2 of our text, chapter 5. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. It's it's interesting there. Paul says, okay, the tabernacle, the tent, dissolved, not discouraged. As a matter of fact, not only am I not discouraged, I am groaning. I'm groaning for this. Now, you know the idea of groaning, I think. And and I think usually we have this negative connotation of groaning. You know, if you're eating dinner and the phone rings, dinner time, the telemarketer's calling again to sell you something that you really don't need or not concerned about, here's what we do. We groan. Ah! Ah! Doesn't this guy trying to make a living know that I'm trying to eat dinner? Ah! We groan. Teenager, clean your room, and you groan. Oh, you got to get a dump truck. Or if you're a sports fan, and your team's on the two-yard line, ready to go to the Super Bowl, and they're playing the Denver Broncos, and the handoff is given, and the guy fumbles on the two, Grant, remember, fumble on the two-yard line, going to the Super Bowl for the Cleveland Browns, and they fumble in the last few seconds of the game or a minute of the game. They fumble, and we, ah, we groan. And we've we've been groaning for 20 years, groaning. Maple Leafs, groaning. (laughs) How many? 40 years of groaning. Groaners. And Paul says, I have a desire. I have a groaning. It's not, Paul is not hating on life. Paul knows how life works. Listen to me. Here's how life works. Sorrow and joy. Pain and blessing. Good times, bad times. I was talking to a dear brother the other day, and he said, we're in a sweet season in our life. And I rejoiced with him. It's good to be in sweet seasons. But for lots of us, we've not been in such a sweet season. And Paul knows that. He's not hating on life. He's not hating on his body. Paul knows this body's a vehicle. It's a tent. uh, And it's been given him by God to take care of, to use, to further the kingdom. He understands that. And and this is not a death wish by Paul. I'm groaning because, oh, I'm, I'm I'm tired of this. That's not what he's talking about. His groaning is a little different here. 
It's a sigh. It's a hopeful longing. It's just totally different. Years ago, we took a trip to Guatemala. It it was a longer extended trip. I I think it was maybe 10, 11, maybe 12 days. I'm not sure. But it was Gregory and David and myself. Kim stayed back. And and for the first week there, you you could not um, communicate and, and back home here, some of the girls, I think it may have been Sam and, and Michelle, maybe Stacy, I'm not sure, but they hooked up Kim with Skype. And we not used Skype before. I'm really not very tech savvy, right? Um, so they had this Skype thing and said, we're going to hook it up for you so you can be in the room and you can talk to Kim after, I don't know, maybe eight or nine days. And so it's like, ring, 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 and you hit the button and her face shows up. And I groaned. And it wasn't like, ugh. It was like, ah, oh. <laughs> uh, it was terrible. It was terrible. It was terrible to see her, but I, it was a longing. It was a wonderful thing. We know that groan. Like, hey, you're getting married next week. Oh, can you believe it? Yes, all right. It doesn't matter now. <laughs> it doesn't matter now. Ah, going on vacation. Ah, I'm, I'm groaning for that. Um. This is the natural language of the heart of the believer. It says, Lord, I know this thing's going to be dissolved, but I desire to be with you. Um, It's not to be unclothed. Paul just says, it's not that I want to be unclothed. I just want to die. But that mortality might be swallowed up in life. And Paul longs for this. There's, um, we sing good songs around here. I, we really do. I think we, we try to get words of substance and meaning. And even this morning, that, that song, I really enjoyed. I, if anything, I just enjoyed Steve. I don't know about anything. I just enjoyed Steve saying, I'm praising the Lord, man. It's a beautiful thing. And what a great truth for this morning. That this is what we're looking for. The trumpet's going to sound. But I don't know that we long for this. Listen to the songwriter that the sands of time are sinking I don't know that we've sung the song much around here, but we probably should. But may, many of you, I think, will know it. And, and listen to the attitude of the songwriter when he talks about the Lord and being with him. The sands of time are sinking. The dawn of heaven breaks. The summer morn I've sighed for. The fair, sweet morn awakes. Dark, dark hath been the midnight. The day spring is at hand. And glory, glory dwelleth. In Emmanuel's land. O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep well of the deep, deep well of love. The streams on earth I've tasted, more deep I'll drink above. There too an ocean fullness, his mercy, mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. O I am my beloved's. And my beloved, mine. He brings a poor, vile sinner into his house of wine. I stand upon his merit. I know no other stand, not even where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but at the pierced hands. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. Do we ever think like that? Do we, I mean, we live this life. I have to tell you, I'm not bashing blessings, but, but I think so many times, We are so full that we have no hunger for the things of God. Look what's interesting here in this text, back in our text, chapter 5. Look at verse number 5, about where this desire comes from. He says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing, this groaning, this longing, is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Paul says, listen, believer, this tent that you have, the precious treasure is within. It is the Spirit of the living God. And it's that Spirit that that within us groans to be clothed upon with life, to be in His presence. This is interesting. Uh, John chapter 
No, it's Romans. Romans 8, 23, about the Spirit and how he groans within us. He says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. And Paul says, in light of what I know, th- this tent will be dissolved. I'm not discouraged. I'm actually, I, I desire this. That's what I long for. Christian, the Spirit of God within you, right? He bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. If he doesn't, you're not his, right? You are not a believer in Christ because you sit in church, because you do good things, because you're religious. That, that's not how this works. No flesh will glory before the Lord. We are saved and born again because we have repented of our sin and turned to Jesus Christ, period, period. But that spirit now resides within you, and in that spirit, there is a longing for home. I hate leaving home. I hate it. I'm such a baby. Dan and I, years ago, would go to these conferences, and they were like three days long, and we'd go there, and after the first night, the second, the second day, I'd say to Dan, hey, you ready to go home? <laughs> no. And it wasn't because he didn't want to go home. He wanted to be at the conference. I couldn't care less. I want to go home. And there's something with the Spirit of God within every believer who says, listen, can you hear it? Can you see it? Do you know this is what's waiting for you? I long to be home. And I just wonder if we're so full of garbage and nonsense that we've sort of squelched that a bit. We have no taste of heaven's joys. Because we're full of earth. And Paul says, that's not me. I long. This isn't a death wish. Paul's got a job to do, right? But he longs and groans for this. It's amazing. Paul talks about real life. Um, he knew real life. He knew real suffering. He, he, real, he knew real trouble. And it's interesting. He doesn't promise to the believers during this time, yeah, it's hard, it's troubling, it's suffering, there's affliction. So just, just hang in there because you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You just name it and claim it. You hold your wallet up or your purse and say, Lord, I'm believing it's full and you'll be fine. He does not do that. A matter of fact, no one in the Bible does that. So if someone's telling you that trash, I quit listening. <laughs> Like, like, like God is really concerned about me being a millionaire. I, he can't trust me with the money he gives me now. Or you. Oh, Lord, if you give me, if I win the lottery, I will. Nonsense. You don't give now and you don't do now. You will not do it if you get $10 billion. We're so stupid. Just dumb. Dumb. I'm talking to myself now. I'm just, I'm just, this is coming out of my mouth. And it's, okay. Paul doesn't promise that nonsense. But here's what he promises. He promises the future resurrection when this frail, mortal body of clay finally succumbs and God will clothe it with an eternal, heavenly dwelling. And that's what he says. That's the promise, not just by Paul, but the promise of God. Okay? And this is what he believes. This is what he longs for. And I want you to see something now. This is what he believes. We know. This is what I'm longing for. And I want you to see something. Because Paul doesn't stop here. And I think a lot of us stop at this point. Um, Paul is not, you know, so heavenly minded that he's not any earthly good. He's not flighting this, this, this uh, pie in the sky. Look, I'm going to heaven. I couldn't care about anything else. That's not what Paul does. In light of what he knows, in light of what he believes, um, he says, because of this now, because of this hope, because of this truth, I labor. I don't sit down waiting for the trumpet to sound and ignore everything around me. He said, in light of this truth, this tent will be dissolved. We don't have to be discouraged. God has prepared a body for us. We groan for this. That's going to happen. And in light of this, here's what I do. I labor. Look at our text again. Look at verse number 6, chapter 5. Therefore, We are always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor. Labor. It's his ambition, his aim, his work. Paul says, in light of what I believe, 
right? And I'm telling you this morning, in light of what you believe, no matter what you say out loud, what you really believe, when I grasp what Paul is saying here, I must say with Paul, I labor. This is now my ambition. This is now my aim. This is my work. This is what I do. Here's what he does, verse number 9. I labor that whether I'm present or absent, we may be accepted of him. He says, in light of what I know, I want to make him happy. I want to make him happy. I want to please him. Please him. Christian, who are you trying to please today? No, no, really. Oh, the Lord. You know, Jesus is the answer for every question. I want to please Jesus. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But really, who are you seeking to make happy today? Pastor, I want to make you happy. Forget about it. You'll never make me happy. <laughs> What's, that? What's that? I want to make my wife, my kids. Hey, that's fine. I'm trying to do stuff for them. But ultimately, believer, in light of what we know and the truth that we have, our labor now should be to please him. Him. The one who gave his son, who shed his blood. You read the rest of this chapter. It's awesome. I owe him everything. And so I labor. I labor to please him. Now, here's a question. Well, how do I make him happy? How do I make God happy? How do I make the one who owns all things, who needs nothing, who uses us in spite of ourselves, how do I make him happy? Well, that's a good question. What does Hebrews chapter 11, 6 say? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And in our text here, if you notice what Paul just said before we got here, he said, we walk by faith not by sight. And don't be, oh, this is that blind jump in the darkness that all Christians are talking about. Nonsense. That is not Christian faith. It is not vague. It is not a leap into darkness. It is a biblical faith is stepping into light. Biblical faith says, this is what God has revealed to be true about himself, the world, and my life. And so I trust him, and I do what he tells me to do. Look at another passage of scripture. It'll be on the wall here, I hope. Um, John chapter 14, verse 15. You want to make God happy? You want to please him? This is resonating with you. You're tracking now. Okay, this is what I do. Verse 14, chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, quit talking about loving God so much and not doing anything he tells you to do. My kids, AJ did that all the time. Dad, I love you. Especially when he's in trouble. First thing you say, Dad, I love you. Okay, what did you do wrong? Right? And finally, I had to say, hey, listen, I love you too, honey. But if you really love me, do what I tell you to do, right? Because I'm your father. And, and Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But, but he goes further than that. And then he says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. And so, you want to make God happy? We'll start walking by faith. What he has revealed about this world, um, life, life in this world, about himself, I say, okay, God, I see it, I believe it, now I do it, and not on my own. The Spirit of God bears witness. This is true. This is right. This pleases him. And the Spirit says, do this. And I do it. And so what I'm saying this morning is this. You can talk about, I believe in life after death. I believe in a resurrected body. I believe in judgment someday. Okay, listen. If that's the case, then we all ought to be laboring to make him happy. Okay? Number two. He says, I want to you know, make him happy. I want to please him. In light of this tent dissolving, dwelling that is permanent, I want to make him happy. Now look at verse 10 because he tells us what motivates him. Verse number 10 of our text. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to notice a couple things about that first statement. Must. This morning, when it comes to judgment, it is not maybe or it could happen or it's possible that you will stand before God. It is, we all must. We must. And then he says, all. My friend, you're not slipping in the back door. You're not, you know, melting in with the crowd. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And Paul says, this motivates me. It motivates me. We know the judgment seat of Christ, the, the term literally is bima, the bima seat. And bima is a word that just means step. And in Roman court, they would have steps like this, right? There's steps, and you'd go up the steps, steps, the bima, and you'd go, and the judge would sit up there, and from his judgment seat, he would then make judgment. And so Paul says, we must all appear before the bima, the judgment seat of Christ, and judgment will be made. Now, look what he says. To receive the things done in our body. Our body. Now, this is really important. Now, stay with me this morning. Because what Paul is saying is, no one escapes judgment, not even Christians. But there is a different judgment between the lost and the saved. There is. And if, you do, if you're not buying that, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, the great white throne judgment... Christ sits, the world flees away from his face, no one's spitting, no one's scoffing, no one's mocking. He's going to rule and reign gloriously, righteously, and everything will put, be put right. But he goes on to say this in verse number 12. He says, 12, there we go, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Most terrifying verse in Scripture. And whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That's judgment. That's judgment for any man or woman who rejects the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I don't care how good you are, how sweet you are to your neighbor, what you're involved in, how you're working in community, without your name being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It doesn't come because you jumped in church, you walked an aisle, you prayed a prayer, and nothing ever... No, it comes when you truly repent and believe. That's, that's salvation. Don't do it later. Today is a day of salvation. It's judgment. But this judgment that Paul is talking about here is not judicial. The one in our text is not this. This is for those who do not know Christ. What he's talking about in our text, writing to the Corinthian church, is I'm talking to believers. This is not judicial. This is different. This is an evaluation. When we were kids, we had um, fundamental circles. Those of you who know how this works, we had a guy come in, and um, I mean, he preached about the judgment seat of Christ. And I think he was trying to get a, a big swelling at the altar, because here's what he said. He said, on the judgment seat of Christ, on that day, every Christian will stand before God, okay, no problem there, and the whole world will be watching, not just 7 billion, but every single believer throughout, you know, six, 7,000 years of history. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a big screen up there. And the Lord is going to say, Rick, come up here. Okay, yes, I'm here. And on this screen, every sin that you ever committed is going to scroll across that screen. Not only every sin, but every thought, every motive. I mean, everything. Can I tell you something? If that's heaven, I don't want to be there. Because I know what's here. I know my past. I know my present. I know my wicked heart. Can I tell you something? My sins were judged at Calvary. At Calvary, Mercy and justice kissed in the cross of Christ. And I've been forgiven. I have been redeemed. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for the believer. My sins have been wiped away. They are under the blood. And I'm, I'm free. I'm forgiven. That's not what's going to happen. That guy was whack. He, he was nuts. And he terrified me for years. For years. I don't want to go there. That's not what we're talking about. This is judicial. And Paul says, I want you to know something. As a believer, you are been, you've been redeemed. You've been saved. But there's an evaluation that the good and the bad that you've done, the good means deeds that are, and motives that are pleasing to the Lord, that are eternal. And the bad means useless, worthless, no lasting value. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. won't read it now. But where Paul talks about the wood, hay, stubble, burned up. The good things will last the fire, and you will be saved, yet so by fire. You will be evaluated, all right, for the good and bad. Now listen to me and understand this. Don't miss this this morning. All right, here, hold on. Here we go. 
We are, as believers, justified by faith alone. You understand this this morning. Justified by faith alone. We're not saved by our works, our merits, our goodness. Justified by faith alone. But listen to me. Your faith and my faith is never alone. Never alone. That's James' whole point. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. God has not saved us to be aimlessly indifferent in the world we live in at all. We are to participate in the advancement of his cause in this world. And what we do in this body as believers has moral significance and eternal consequences. In this body, your tent, your tabernacle, as a believer, will be evaluated. And that's, that's why we're not indifferent about what's happening around us. The whole book of Corinthians, written to believers, Paul says, what you do in your body matters. That's why, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Why? Because your body's a temple. It belongs to God. You're going to be judged for what you do with it. It's not to be used like that. It's premarital sex, adultery, fornication. No, you flee those things. Why? Because we're going to give a judgment for what we do in this body. He goes on to uh, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians and says, listen, make sure you don't take advantage of other believers by hauling them off to court. Christians don't sue Christians. At least that's what Paul's understanding was. Why? Because the church is a, is a called out assembly of believers who are now brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a real bad testimony about what you're doing in your body. He goes on to say in chapter 11, um, don't be indifferent, quit humiliating the poor. Why would it matter? The poor you have with you always. Yeah, you ought to really read that over because what Jesus was saying is, oh, the poor you have with you always, just mistreat them. No, the woman who's washing his feet, she broke the alabaster back box, she loved him, and, and Judas wants to give money to the poor. And Jesus says, Mark chapter 14, 7. Jesus says, hey, you have the poor with you always. What she did was good. You want to do good to the poor? Go do good to the poor. He wasn't saying ignore the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 11 says open your hands to them. Why does it matter? Because we will be evaluated with what we do with our time, our talents, our resources in this body. James chapter 1, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit or care for widows and the fatherless. Why? Because it matters. Let's wrap it up this morning. Junior church is going to be screaming in a second. Verse number 11. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, now this might not jive with some of us this morning, because it's like, wait a minute, I'm longing to be with God, and yet knowing the fear of the Lord, this doesn't make sense to me. But I think if you'll think for a moment, it will make sense. What's the beginning of wisdom? You know, the fear of the Lord. When I have a proper understanding of who he is and what he does, I start to live a life of wisdom, Right? And what Paul does here, and what all writers of the New Testament do, there's a tension here between, right, um, being with God and fearing the Lord. And this works out in the real world. Responsibility without accountability is a nightmare. You folks that work a job, okay, and you're not the supervisor or the boss, tell me what happens the moment the boss or the supervisor walks off the floor or leaves a building, is out of the office, or gets in his truck and drives away. Does everyone work a lot harder then? Has that been your experience? Like, hey, he's gone. Let's work really hard now. When he gets back, let's surprise him. He'll be amazed. She'll be amazed at what we've done while they're away. Does that happen? Not for me. (laughs) No, no, it doesn't happen. It's human nature. And Paul says, listen, I fear the Lord. And this helps me keep this tension between assurance and warning. This life is fleeting, it's passing. I'm going to stand before this God of heaven. I need to be ready to give an account of my life. Now, in closing, some of you folks have the idea, well, Jesus loves me, this I know. I'm not worried about it because he's all love. And so I'm sort of sitting uh, on my thumb and nothing's going on. I'm okay, I'm just going to get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. First off, if that's your attitude, you better check out your salvation. I'm just going to slide in this thing and do nothing. I would say to you, you're either lost or you have a terrible misunderstanding of what it means to be saved and redeemed and purchased and bought. But let me say this to you. If you think that Jesus is just cool with everything you do, 
There was an apostle or disciple. His name was John, whom Jesus loved. He was so familiar with Jesus that at the Lord's table, when he instituted that, they would lay down right on their side to eat. Not, no chairs. They just lay down on their side like this, right? And they'd, they'd dig in with their food. He was so comfortable. This really is comfortable. I can see why some of you sleep in church now. <laughs> he was so comfortable that he put his head on the chest of Christ. That, that's how familiar he was with Jesus. And a sweet thing. My boys today, they still kiss me. You can call him a wimp, but I think AJ would break your head, right? But it's okay. He was, he was that close to Christ. And yet, Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, when he sees the risen Christ, the disciple that Jesus loved, it says, I fell at his feet as dead, whose eyes were like a flame of fire. Why? Because he looked through me. He, my soul. You talk to them like this. I mean, they looked into my soul. It's terrifying. Jesus does. And, and John, who loved Christ, knew that there was a healthy fear of him. And so don't have this idea that like, it doesn't matter. Jesus is cool with what I'm doing. I would say you should read Revelation chapter 1 and find out he's not really cool with what you're doing. And then others of you sit here and say, well, it doesn't matter what you see. Who cares? God knows. So don't be judging me. Don't you love this? Judge not, lest you be judged. You should read the whole chapter, which is all about judgment. Right? He's talking about, he's talking about uh, unrighteous, pharisaical judgment. Right? But don't judge me. It doesn't matter that people around me don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Well, look at our text again, and we'll close with this. Verse number 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, and, but we are manifest unto God. Here's what Paul says. I'm working. I'm laboring. I want to please him. I'm, I'm motivated by this, and God knows. Yes, he knows. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. No question there. But look what he says next. And I trust also are made manifest to your consciousness. Paul says, I'm laboring and God knows my heart, but I hope that you've watched my life and you see that what I'm living for is him. My works, my labor, my motivation, you see it. I can stand before you and my, your conscience is clear because you know it does matter. And so this morning, we'll close with this. Do you believe in life after death? I hope you do. And if you don't, you will someday. Do you believe in a body of the resurrection? You should, because Jesus got out of the ground in a body. And the spirit of God that raised up Christ lives in us. And Paul says, he's, he's built one for you. Eternal one. Do you believe in a judgment day? No one will escape it. No one. Christian and lost. But the Christian has confidence because I've been cleared by the blood of Christ, but there will be an evaluation. And so here's the question. In light of what you say you believe, are we living like that? And I would argue that you might not really believe what you say you believe. This should change us. It should change us. Not sitting on our hands, but laboring. Why? To get to heaven? No. I want to please him. I'm motivated by the fact I'm going to stand before him. And in that day, the only thing I want to hear is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray.